just to pick up a little bit of what we teach in the program, basically what we're teaching are approaches to negotiation that can be applied in almost any circumstance. Um, we also talk about uh, strategies uh, that are uh, helping you reach satisfying agreements. So we're, we're, we're looking at the, the fundamentals of negotiation, and then we're looking at the actual strategies you employ to actually make those fundamentals go forward and to help you reach your goals. Um, we also teach quite a lot about the psychological underpinnings uh, to negotiations, uh, particularly areas like decision making um, and persuasion and influence, um, but also the apparent sort of lack of rationality that one sometimes comes across in negotiations. So understanding all of those things better. Um, and, and there's a lot more to the five day program to that. The reason I introduce it like this is to make the point that we've had people who have been ambassadors, we've had people that are arms control specialists, we've had CEOs, CFOs of big companies, uh, we've had a lot of lawyers, and many, many different people who come to Oxford for this week with us, we do it twice a year, um, with different objectives. They have in mind very different negotiations going forward. And our experience is that they do actually, by looking at um, cases and simulations that we've developed for them, which are some are public sector, others are more diplomatic nature, they're all different types. Um, many of them are simulations that should never be remotely what you're going to be seeing in real life. But pedagogically, those work because they can apply to any type of negotiation. So what I want to do this afternoon is to look at several um, substantial negotiations um, and um, that, sorry, I'm just having difficulty advancing my slide. Um, uh, several negotiations of recent years um, and uh, a couple of them I was personally involved in um, uh, and another one uh, I've not been personally involved in it, but um, I've given quite a lot of speeches on it and I've been following it very, very closely. So the first one I want to, I'll just quickly run over what these are before we get into them. Uh, the first is looking at the negotiations to end the war in Bosnia. Um, and this was all happening 20, 22, 23 years ago, 24 years ago. So almost a quarter of a century ago, but it was the negotiations that brought an end to this horrifying war in Europe uh, with genocide and uh, just uh, concentration camps, so many horrible things that were going on in Bosnia and the, 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 the Europeans and the world at large have been just watching them happen uh, without really doing much to, to, to end it. Um, the second one I want to look at is um, Brexit, the negotiations that have been going on for the last several months um, to uh, for, for the UK to leave the European Union and what lessons we can take from that. And then there's North Korea, which is a big fear in many, many people's minds as to what's going to happen there. Um, and the question of whether one can actually negotiate with the North Koreans. Um, and then finally, uh, I just want to touch briefly on uh, President Trump's efforts to negotiate with the US Congress and, and with others. So that's the, that's the agenda of the four things. And what I want to do is take a look at these and, um, and, and just draw odds and ends of, um, of little lessons from them. Um, the, the, there may not be a total logic to the way we look at these. We can talk about what was going on and then uh, what we learn as negotiators from, uh, from, from these experiences. And, this is the sort of thing that we, um, um, so I'm getting some feedback. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I could get, 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 I thought it was feedback coming from, from this, but it's coming from somewhere else. Um, so anyway, let's, let's, let's move straight away to uh, look at um, ending the war in Bosnia. Now, just to give you a little bit of a sense of the background to this, um, those of you who aren't familiar with that part of the world, the Balkans, um, uh, Yugoslavia had been a country made up of uh, eight entities altogether, six provinces, 
to uh, the six six um, uh, uh, states actually, and then two two autonomous provinces. Um, they uh, had under Tito, under Marshal Tito, from the end of the Second World War uh, until Tito died uh, in I think 1980, 80, uh, I think it was. Um, they'd done quite well as Yugoslavia. It, 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 it was reasonably prosperous. They had a, a, a peculiar version called self-management of communism, but it uh, was different from uh, the rest of the communist bloc. Um, but after Tito died, this very strong unifying force, um, it was left for several years that there would be a rotating presidency between the various parts of uh, the, the countries that made up Yugoslavia. This worked fine as long as the economy was working well, but then when the economy went south, um, nationalism came to the fore. And the main protagonists that are relevant for our discussion is that uh, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, who uh, angled himself to become the president of Serbia and wanted uh, a greater Yugoslavia to be maintained, with Serbia as the dominant part of it. He appealed very much to Serb nationalism and therefore was very negative towards the other parts that made up ex Yugoslavia, Slovenia, Croatia, um, and Bosnia, and then perhaps less important, Montenegro and uh, Macedonia. Um, as he was sort of exerting his power, um, President Tudjman of Croatia also had designs on Bosnia. So Bosnia got caught in the middle here. Uh, Slovenia left Yugoslavia fairly quickly, and then you had Bosnia in the middle. And it, the, the, the war between the Croat forces and the Serbian forces and the Bosnians themselves uh, became very, very devastating tremendous loss of life and genocide in Europe, which after the Second World War, everybody thought they'd seen the last of. Um, lots of efforts by the European Union to bring the protagonist to the table. And what you need to understand is that there was the, uh, the, 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 the Croats and the uh, Bosniaks, was the Muslims in, um, in Bosnia, but also the Bosnian Serbs, and the Bosnian Serbs, you could say, are the descendants of Gavrilo Princip, who fired the shot that started the First World War. They consider Princip to be a hero. Um, and there was immense nationalism going on here. And the, uh, there were atrocities pretty much all around, but particularly the very, very fierce um, behavior of the, of, of the Bosnian Serbs. And they were read, led by Radovan Karadzic and uh, Ratko Mladic. So, after lots of efforts to try to get them to the conference table, uh, conferences in Geneva, where Slobodan Milosevic was in his element, uh, talking to journalists and uh, uh, holding court almost, a quite charismatic man. Uh, but the other leaders all doing their thing and they were all busy briefing the press and so on, but it wasn't going anywhere. Finally, the Americans decided that they, uh, President Clinton became president and decided that he wanted to change what was going on there. And he put in charge of an American effort to bring everybody to the table, a man called Richard Holbrook. And Richard Holbrook was, had been involved in many negotiations, a very powerful, um, tough negotiator, a man with sharp elbows. He had been involved in the uh, negotiations to end the Vietnam War, which of course was somewhat ignominious for the US, uh, but he'd been at the all those negotiations that led to the uh, agreement in Paris that ended the Vietnam War. Um, he'd been involved a little bit with North Korea before, immense experience, and was an assistant secretary of state. Uh, Ambassador Holbrook went into Bosnia to try to see what he could do. Now, the first thing he did was to look at why everything was a stalemate. And the, 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 the issue, uh, the, the things he had to cope with were the fact that for a long time, the Serbs had been bombing Sarajevo, uh, shooting snipers had killed hundreds and hundreds of people in Sarajevo. And every time there was a mortar attack or anything like that, the, um, 
NATO would be authorized by the UN because it was a dual command that any uh, action, hostile action, any bombing, any uh, air force action had to be approved by both the UN and NATO. And they would go in and they would remove a pinprick. They would bomb a particular mortar site and so on. And that was it. And they would say, you must not you must stop doing this. We're going to keep pounding you. But they just bombed one little mortar site and they took out one gun or one mortar and maybe killed a couple of people. And it just was not credible. So that was one thing that he had to grapple with. Another was that up till then, up till he, the time he took charge, everybody had been negotiating with um, Karadzic and Mladic, two indicted war criminals. Holbrook said, we're going to do this completely different. We're going to completely reset the parameters of this negotiation because it's not going anywhere. These are indicted war criminals. They're mafiosi. Uh, they're disgusting people. And while we may not like Milosevic very much, ultimately without Milosevic's support, they can't go anywhere. So one of the important things in a negotiation is to look at the, at the framework of the negotiation and see if you can reframe it to your advantage. So the first thing you do is to disenfranchise these two war criminals and deal with Milosevic. Um, the other thing was that something you learn in negotiations that sometimes when you inherit negotiations that are halfway through, there are some things you can abandon, but other things you're stuck with. And it had already been agreed that any uh, negotiated settlement in Bosnia would go 51% to the federation of the, uh, of the Bosnian Croats and the Bosniaks, and 49% would go to uh, the Serbs. And that was called Republika Srpska. And one of the things that um, Holbrook realized was that he couldn't change that 4951 thing, and unfortunately he couldn't change the name Republika Srpska, which dignified the Serb side led by these two war criminals. So, so one of the things, lessons from this is, if you come into a negotiation that's already underway, see if you can reframe it to your advantage. Secondly, making the threat of force credible. And this was uh, a, a, a big, big issue that he just felt it was pointless that people were being killed because the people perpetrating these atrocities felt there was no penalty. So they told the Bosnian Serbs, you do this one more time and we're really going to hit you very hard. And then when 37 people were killed in a marketplace in Sarajevo, um, Richard Holbrook got on to the Secretary General's office in New York to speak to Boutros Boutros Ghali, the Secretary General, because the Secretary General had to approve every use of force. He was not available. He was on holiday. And uh, he may have chosen to be unavailable, but he wasn't available. So he then went to his deputy, Kofi Annan, who several years later became Secretary General. And Kofi Annan said, do whatever you need to do. So they then started a campaign of very, very substantial bombing um, of Serb positions. Uh, this went on for two or three weeks. Um, one or two things still happened. One or two attacks still went on. And then at one point, they decided to use a Tomahawk cruise missile. And in one missile, cruise missile attack, they destroyed all of the communication systems of the Bosnian Serbs and their communications, even with Belgrade. Um, that brought them to the table. In fact, Milosevic visited Belgrade, saw, uh, sorry, uh, Holbrook visited uh, Belgrade, went to see Milosevic, and Milosevic said, well, I'm getting on the phone now to, uh, to, to the Bosnian Serbs. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and his aide came back and said, sorry, we can't get through. There are no communications. And that they realized the power of, so this was turning an idle threat into a serious threat, and that brought them to the table. Something else, if you're looking at the slides, you'll see is predictable surprises. This is a, a phenomenon where um, uh, you can sort of prepare for um, the unexpected. And it's a, a difficult concept to understand, but all along, Holbrook and his American colleagues had felt it was quite likely at some point, even though they disenfranchised the war criminals, um, Ladic and Karadzic, that 
sometime it was possible that they might be sprung on them. And one evening they went to, it was in uh, November 1995, um, they, uh, they went to, uh, to see, um, no, September 1995, uh, they went to see Milosevic in Belgrade, and Belgrade took them to one of Tito's old hunting lodges just outside Belgrade. And they had some drinks, they were talking, and Milosevic suddenly said, would you like to meet uh, Karadzic and Vladic? They're at another villa 200 meters from here. Unfortunately, Holbrook had prepared for this. They'd all talked about it. Should we shake their hands, for example, if we do meet them? So they'd, they'd, they'd role played what would happen if this happened. This is a really good thing to do in a negotiation, to try to anticipate things that, that are not obvious, but just might happen, and then role play and try to figure out what you do if they do happen. And so they were able that night to get all of these people to sign a piece of paper that basically agreed to um, a, uh, a, a, a conference. Now, they didn't want to do it in Geneva because they said Geneva leaks like a sieve, everybody's staying in different hotels, all the delegations are briefing journalists, and you're not really going anywhere. It's far too public. And so they decided that they would do it in the United States, even though it was a European war. And most of the National Security Council in the US uh, was against doing this, but that they, um, yeah. they, they should do it in the US. The US would control it. And they then chose Wright-Patterson Air Base in Dayton, Ohio, near Dayton, Ohio. The reason they did that is because it had a very, very tall fence, barbed wire fence around it. No journalists could get in and no delegates could get out. It also enabled them to have single uh, uh, bachelor officers' quarters uh, where everybody could have the same rather comfortable and luxurious um, uh, place to stay all around a little circle. So they were, you would have each of the presidents in a different building, uh, but in, with a fair degree of luxury, so they were not feeling they would be badly treated. Um, but then they could do shuttle diplomacy between them until finally they could start to get them together. Um, so that was quite important. And if you control the venue, that can actually help a lot. It's a big advantage if you can control the venue. No, there's no way anybody could brief the press. Uh, communications were, were really locked down. Also, because they control the venue, they could send some quite important signals. And often the almost subliminal signals you send during negotiations can be very important. So for a big dinner they had a few days into the negotiations, they set up all the tables with a table for the Serbs, a table for the uh, Croatians, a table for the Bosn Bosnians, and, and then for the Europeans and the Americans. And these tables were set up under the wing of a B-52 bomber. Actually, Carl built the uh, former Swedish prime minister who was heading the European delegation was very unhappy about the fact that all the meeting rooms had names like B-52 and F-111 and things like that. He said he thought it was too warlike, which Holbrook's view was, well, these are people who have been waging war for a long time. They can live with that. But they put the tables under a B-52, and they, the, the symbolism of that was very clear. These B-52s could do a lot of harm to, to the people if they didn't agree. And then during the dinner, Holbrook took Milosevic led him over to a Tomahawk missile, which is about 18 foot long, it's not that big, and said, see that? That's what destroyed all your communications. And we got lots of those. So the threat was there and they were brought to the table. The other thing as well, the, you know, one of the key things about all this is don't make threats unless you can carry them through. So big lesson in negotiations, never make threats unless you can carry them through. And the other thing was that as well as the stick, which was the threat, there were some carrots. Obviously they wanted to bring peace to the region, they wanted to return refugees to their homes, all of those things, but also they made it clear that if they managed to come with, up with an agreement, that the international community would provide a lot of money for reconstruction, resettling, rebuilding of, ins of institutions and so on. And this is where my personal involvement came through this. I was at the time the chief spokesman of the World Bank, 
I'd actually written a book about Yugoslavia early in my career at the World Bank. And so the team that was working on reconstruction asked me if I would join their team in addition to my day job. So I became very much involved in the post-Dayton negotiations to provide the aid. And in a single day in Brussels, we raised $5.1 billion. And then over the next uh, few years, we dispersed all this money to send a signal to everybody in Bosnia and the region that there was an alternative to war, that businesses could thrive. The country has not done phenomenally well since then, but there has been no more fighting um, uh, since the Dayton Peace Accords in 1995. And uh, the, 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 it is a reasonably peaceful part of the part of the world that people did discover that they could um, uh, have an alternative to war. So that's a fairly lengthy uh, set of snippets uh, to, do with, uh, to do with Bosnia. Um, one other little thing I'd mention is quite interesting. In all negotiations, when you've got an agreement, you then need to make sure that you take care of a lot of details. And often, this terribly hackneyed phrase, the devil is in the details, but often um, you, you can actually, things are unexpected, which can really mess things up. One was that, after the agreement, um, it was when people drove around in Bosnia Herzegovina, which is what the country's called, it was possible to tell from the number plates whether they were Serbs driving the car or uh, whether they were likely to be uh, non Serbs. But the way you can tell that was because in Serbia they use the Cyrillic alphabet, everywhere else they use the, um, the, the, the Roman alphabet. And so what they did is they chose the short, the, the limited number of letters that are common to both alphabets. And they decreed that those were the only ones that were used on number plates. Because what happened was that when people were seen driving around with non-Cyrillic um, um, uh, number plates, you had Serb thugs firing on the cars and attacking them because of the number plate. So they're just very simple. They took both alphabets and they picked out the small number of letters that are common to both alphabets, and they decreed those are the only ones that could be on cars, and all the attacks on cars stopped. So it's paying attention to a lot of details sometimes is, is really, really important. So let me move on. I spent a long time on Bosnia. It's, it's an area that I'm very interested in. It's, it's really quite close to my heart. Um, so let's, let's look now um, at Brexit. And really what I'd like to say with Brexit is that Brexit negotiations in the last year and a half have been a masterclass on, not, on how not to do it, I'm sorry to say. I feel this very strongly about my country, the UK, uh, but also I don't think the European Union has really crowned itself in glory, although they maybe have been a little bit cleverer than our people have. Uh, and there are a number of rules that I'm highlighting here which, which are, are, are really relevant to, um, to negotiations which really applied with, with, with Brexit. Uh, in any negotiation, you need to have a degree of unity on your own side. Very often in negotiations, you need to negotiate internally before you negotiate externally. And we see it today, the continued um, uh, uh, bad blood between lots of different entities in the UK. Secondly, you really should agree on ground rules before you start a negotiation. And it should have been, in my view, agreed between Brussels and London that uh, everything is on the table. Not that, well, we don't move to the next phase until we've agreed on how much you're going to pay us for leaving the European Union. And that was a massive mistake that the UK agreed to. They should have said, everything's on the table, everything can be exchanged, everything is in play. Because one of the things we teach in the Oxford program on negotiation is how keep things in play as long as you can, and then you can make beneficial trades. That's been made very difficult because the negotiations were held up for an immense amount of time while they tried to settle on uh, how much the UK should pay to leave. The other thing is that the unbelievably juvenile rhetoric, that the insulting language between Brussels and London, and both sides have been guilty of this, you know, was just really 
completely unnecessary. You know, Britain voted, whatever one thinks of that vote, Britain did vote to leave the European Union. You know, that's something that everybody has to live with. They need to make the best of it and not, some of the language has been really totally counterproductive. It created a very, very bad atmosphere. In negotiation, you're meant to put yourself in the other side's shoes. You don't do that if you're insulting them. Another big mistake, and Theresa May has been particularly guilty of this, is announcing these are red lines. Now, you know, when you announce red lines, it is a form of threat. Remember, uh, Barack Obama in Syria said that if the Syrians use chemical weapons, weapons, they will have crossed a red line and they will pay the penalty. Well, they did use chemical weapons and nothing happened. It's you're holding yourself hostage to fortune if you threaten that if you cross red lines, you know, big penalties. Because almost certainly the red lines they talk about will end up being crossed. And one of the big things they've talked about is, well, we, we just simply will not have any jurisdiction from the European Court of Justice. But for certain types of activity for regular day-to-day -day living in Europe, Actually, uh, there are disputes that have to be um, um, settled uh, at the European Court of Justice. So, I mean, it's just an example. Don't talk about red lines. The other thing is these negotiations have been incredibly public. Every uh, uh, concession that is, is, is considered by the negotiating teams find themselves into the newspapers. And... Um, Sorry, I've got a problem. There's a buzzing going on here. Excuse me just for a second. Um, so don't make your proposed concessions public. Don't do all the negotiations in, in front of the media because that really gives you very little uh, room for movement. Um, and then don't make unrealistic promises to anybody, particularly to your constituencies, your publics. So. The people favoring a hard Brexit have been saying, look, once we get out of the European Union, once we sever our trade ties with the European Union or greatly reduce them, then we are free to make all these great trade deals around the world. But are they really? The recent Canadian trade deal with the European Union agreed last year, took seven years to negotiate um, and it, the number of pages constitutes almost precisely the same number of pages of the complete works of Shakespeare and the Old and New Testaments of the Bible put together. You know, you don't negotiate something like that instantly. I was just in Australia and New Zealand uh, the week before last. Um, a lot of talk about the great deals they're going to make with them. Theresa May was in China. All the great deals are going to do with China. Actually, these are the amounts of uh, volume are much, much smaller than the volume of the European Union, and they're not going to be done overnight. So I think that was another thing, they're making lots of unrealistic promises. So I'm just jumping around here, but these are just some of the sorts of rules that we'll be teaching in the Oxford Programme on Negotiation, and these are examples of where they, where they, um, uh, have, have, you know, they've gone wrong. Um, well, the next picture, if you want to know what I look like, I'm the one in the middle, surrounded mainly by North Koreans, I haven't been arrested for crossing a river from China or anything like that. I was invited to Pyongyang in 2008 by the United Nations to teach UN officials in North Korea how to negotiate. And roughly two thirds of the people you see there, the entire class is not there, but uh, half the class were North Koreans, half the class are people from other parts of the world. And this was at the end of a two day program. As you can see, there were a fair number of smiles. Uh, we uh, covered a lot of the same sort of things we cover in the Oxford Programme on Negotiation. And it was a very interesting experience for me because I found that while there was a lot of suspicion and not particularly friendly at first, actually once they got into doing role plays and once they got into understanding the thinking behind the way we teach negotiation at Oxford, all these North Koreans became very engaged and I was very impressed, number one, how very smart they were. These are elite North Koreans because they're employed by the UN. Um, they do jobs at the UN. Uh, the uh, young lady, bottom right, you see with the glasses and the flowered white jacket, she was the secretary of the head of UNICEF. She was also 
the minder assigned to make sure I didn't get into trouble. And she's also an employee of the North Korean government. And she's helping to be with the rest of them, the eyes and ears of the North Korean government in the UN. But these are good, smart people. They picked up all the lessons very effectively. So anybody who thinks that North Korea is only peopled by, of course, many people living in extreme poverty, a lot of starvation and so on, but there are some very smart people there. That should in itself give us perhaps, this is just a, a little snapshot of some people that I uh, got to know, uh, but there are um, engaged, intelligent people there who understand about how to negotiate. And while I was there, there were other negotiations going on, which I was able to observe, um, where clearly the North Koreans are thinking quite rationally about how they negotiate. So we now have a crisis with North Korea. And when you listen to the rhetoric between um, uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, it's terrifying. Um, people were calling the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, the, there was the false alarm of a possible missile attack on Japan a few weeks ago. It's a very frightening standoff. And the question arises, and this question often comes up in negotiation, are you, are you negotiating with people that are rational or are they irrational? Well, I'd like to suggest that um, both Donald Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un are rational. Um, I think that they're both unpredictable and I think that President Trump is probably, I suspect, a little bit more unpredictable than uh, Kim. Um, but certainly they have an agenda. Trump has tried to up the ante to try to stop the North Koreans getting nuclear weapons, particularly intercontinental ballistic weapons uh, or missiles, uh, which could threaten the United States. We don't know for sure because we don't know how much of the North Korean rhetoric to believe, but it seems as if that quest to stop them probably has failed. So that moves us into a new, um, a, a new setup. And therefore we're looking at probably trying, no longer being able to stop them getting the weapons, but recognizing that they are a country that has a deterrent. Um, from Kim's point of view, so, upping the rhetoric by using this very unpleasant language, Trump has nevertheless put pressure on the North Koreans. Looking at it from Kim's point of view, is Kim rational? It's quite interesting when you, when you look very closely at everything that he's done and all his speeches and so on. And, and, and it's interesting that uh, there are a lot of things that I think most people in the West find immensely unappealing, but there is a certain, um, logic to what Kim is doing. He embraces something called Byungjin, which is uh, a Korean word, which is a, a two-track approach to what he is trying to do. And this two-track approach, and it's been in their vocabulary since his father day, father's day, it's, it's 20 years or so they've been talking about this, it's to accelerate as fast as possible the acquisition of nuclear weapons in order to prevent uh, North Korea being invaded and in order to uh, uh, avoid uh, decapitation of the leadership, in other words, regime change. So on the one hand, make ourselves nuclear capable so that nobody will dare attack us on the one hand, and that will also then uh, give us the opportunity to, the space, if you want to call it that, to actually um, uh, reform our economies. Some of the language, and again, you don't know how much of the rhetoric to believe, but has talked quite a lot, Kim has been talking quite a lot in his New Year's message and others about uh, our people no longer talking about a heroic struggle so much, they do talk about that, but the fact that they are starving and we shouldn't be letting people to starve. It's not a noble thing to starve. It's a devastating thing to starve. We need to try to, there are little, tiny little pinpricks of efforts to allow a free market to operate and so on. So 
it's, it's economic reform and potential growth, which has been non-existent in the past, combined with getting the nuclear weapons. Not a very attractive, but is, there's a certain logic to it. So um, Trump, on the other hand, you know, wanted to stop nuclear weapons. Now it moves to a new phase where it's getting the North Koreans to sign the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, it's trying to get them to stop spreading their nuclear weapons and uh, to stop them testing and so on. Um, and to try to sort of uh, reduce tensions on the Korean peninsula. Um, they both sides have got objectives. I mean, Kim would like North Korea to be united and looking more like North Korea than like South Korea. But there are some somewhat promising things. One of the things they've had to overcome is something called naive realism, which is a sense that you think that you are in the right, that your way of doing things is the right way, and everybody else is doing it wrong. And this builds up to um, a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies where everything the North Koreans do simply reinforces our negative opinions of them, and that's the way they feel about the US. In fact, the rhetoric when I was in North Korea in 2008 is not very different from the rhetoric now. That's the way they talk about America, extremely negative, very insulting and so on. So we need to get beyond the rhetoric, and this is true in negotiations more broadly, try to get beyond the rhetoric. The other thing is in all negotiations, see if you can learn from past negotiations. And when they got an agreement of sorts in 1994, 95 with the North Koreans, uh, to, uh, to, to have them observe the non-proliferation treaty, uh, to allow inspections of their nuclear facilities. And part of the deal was they were going to get quite a lot of aid from the US with other forms of energy creation. Um, but then that all fall apart, fell apart in due course. But at the point where it was working well in 1994, uh, the thing that caused the breakthrough was when President Jimmy Carter went to Pyongyang at the invitation of the North Koreans. Um, and uh, that led to a breakthrough. He didn't have, he didn't go there officially from the United States. He's a former president, uh, but with the, with the blessing uh, of the Clinton administration. And uh, that did cause a breakthrough. He went beyond his mandate before what he said he was gonna do. And he actually got people to the table. And that has, forces me to think, is there a possible breakthrough move that would occur here? I think what's encouraging is that in the last few weeks, we've seen that the North Koreans and the South Koreans are cooperating on the Olympics. North Koreans are going to be at the Olympics, and in, in some sports, they're actually going to compete as one team. I think that's very, very exciting. Uh, it, it just means they're talking to each other, which is good. Any sort of talking to each other. I've been to the Truce village at Panmunjom many, many years before I went to North Korea proper. And there's an extraordinary sort of standoff there. But now they're starting to meet across that famous table in Panmunjom. So I think that's important. But the, what I see as a possible breakthrough move is that the Secretary General of the UN could be mandated by the Security Council because the Security Council is the one that's imposed sanctions and say, look, if sanctions are going to be reconsidered for North Korea, we, you in North Korea should accept a delegation which the Security Council is mandating me as the Secretary General to send out there. A possible makeup of such a delegation could be Ban Ki-moon, a former Secretary General of the UN, um, a South Korean, so he understands the way Koreans think. He has negotiated with North Korea in the past, but he doesn't hold a public office at the moment. He doesn't doesn't work for the South Korean government. He's a South Korean, but a former Secretary General of the UN. So potentially trusted by many people. Second person on that delegation might be uh, Robert Gallucci, who was the main negotiator in 1994. And ever since 1994, he has um, uh, conducted what they call um, dual track negotiations with the people he negotiated with in North Korea. So he's kept the lines of communication open with officials in North Korea over those years, uh, 24 years since 1994. The third member of that team, because China is such a big player in all of this, would be to have a Chinese member of the team, but not somebody from the Chinese government. So the Chinese government uh, in many ways feel that 
they don't have as good contacts as they'd like. The people who used to deal with the past are no longer there. So, but they are nevertheless very important players in the region. And so one thought I had was that the president of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is located in Beijing, um, but it's a, a multilateral body, uh, like the World Bank, like the Asian Development Bank, that the head of that, who's Chinese, could be part of that delegation to demonstrate to the uh, North Koreans that if they do come to the table, just like they promised aid for Bosnia, there could be a lot of aid coming in there, and that would be an incentive. So that's the sort of scenario that might work in North Korea. Let me finish. I've talked a little bit too long, but let me just go to briefly to Donald Trump. Trump is analyzed ad nauseam every day. And so I can't really add an awful lot, but just looking at it from a negotiating point of view, this is a man who had a book published under his name called The Art of the Deal. So he is under the impression that he is a great negotiator. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the last year and a bit since he's been in office is that actually he's not very good at achieving good outcomes in negotiations. And many rules he breaks. One is that in a negotiation, it's a good idea to be consistent. Occasionally, you will need to change. You need to make mid-course corrections and so on. But you need to have a degree of constituency. You need to say the same things to the same people and so on. And you, you, you need to um, not go off on a tangent. And, and Trump lacks discipline. And a lack of discipline is a big problem in a negotiation. So tweeting things early in the morning which are inconsistent with what your Secretary of State or your Secretary of Treasury or Secretary of Defense are saying is not a good idea. Always in negotiations, you put yourself in the other side's shoes. Unfortunately, Trump never does that. Also, we talked about in Brexit, the disarray within the Conservative government on how to negotiate Brexit. And we know there's disarray within the White House. Knowing who your allies are and knowing who your uh, opponents are is very important. I don't like to use the word opponent, but in this case, they really are opponents. But normally we talk about counterparts in negotiation, but he cannot orchestrate his allies. Um, and that is another big problem, or for that matter, understand his opponents. So um, just a word or two about the Oxford program of negotiation, then we'll be getting your questions. Any other questions coming in? Good, good. Well, I've talked so much, they have to do something. Um, uh, we have a very good faculty, a very good teaching faculty. We also have three very, very good tutors who help people when they sign up for the program. Uh, uh, our tutors, one American, uh, one, uh, one American lawyer, actually, one uh, Portuguese lecturer uh, and one uh, Swedish Chinese citizen. Uh, uh, so we, we, we sort of cover the sort of profiles of our participants through our tutors. Um, we I think we have very, very good teaching faculty at really, really first class. One of our tutors is also one of our lecturers. Um, we have very good guest speakers. Uh, this year, we're going to be having the world's leading hostage negotiator, Sue Williams. Um, most of the people who come on our program are not going to be trying to free hostages, but uh, there are many lessons of what she does. Oxford is a great place. Very good experience being in Oxford. Um, if we have 35 people, we probably have them from 25 different countries. Very, very diverse, very interesting. Uh, most of the simulations and cases you do if you do this program are ones we've written ourselves. You won't have found them anywhere else, and they're, they're all quite very stimulating. And I think it's a very enjoyable learning experience. And, uh, and what we teach, we, with all modesty, think does work. So, over to mm -hmm. questions. Yeah, just um, give you a pause and um, just to say thank you very much for a really comprehensive um, webinar so far. We do have some questions coming through, um, but if I may, Tim, I've just um, got one to get things going and then um, we'll, we'll get some uh, questions from the audience. Um, but you talked earlier about um, and you gave a couple of examples about uh, negotiations um, that are complex and that can get stuck. Um, and that things can take time. And I was wondering if you'd be so kind as to just give me an example of um, what might help something become unstuck, um, perhaps using a uh, like a contract project management example, if there's something that comes to mind, um, or perhaps something that you've heard from a participant or from your experience 
dealing with other agencies um, where things have been able to move on um, from a fresh perspective, perhaps? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's obviously everything's on a case by case basis, and sometimes <clears throat> you almost have to come up with something completely new, um, like the, you know, the case of Bosnia when. Uh, they say we're going to completely reframe everything, and that that can 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 change things. Um, in, I mean, I do quite a lot of work in China, and sometimes I get a little bit frustrated because things seem to be just sitting in the same place the whole time. Really wish that we could move them forward. And as much as anything, I find myself there trying to being being persuaded by my team not to push too hard, not to, and, and that that actually can, can be counterproductive to do that. So I think you need to be very careful and just make sure that anything new you introduce is, um, is, is, is genuinely appealing to the other side. Um, and, and obviously put on the spot like this, I can't instantly think of, of, the, uh, of, of the good commercial examples, um, but um, I think, I think that's all I can suggest you try to think of something, you know, think laterally. And one of the things you're often trying to do in negotiations is bring new issues to the table. And sometimes it's the introduction of a new issue that can enable, enable you to, to, get, to get a breakthrough you wouldn't otherwise have. Thank you very much. Well, the question here is why do long-standing negotiations fail uh, for example, in Kashmir, Israel, Palestine. Well, I think that one of the constraints in, for instance, Kashmir is that um, the United Nations has for quite a long time offered its good offices to try to um, bring about discussions between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. And they have been told, you do not have a mandate. This is not any of your business. And you do need to get both sides to agree to come to the table. And certainly we used to have teaching or doing an evening session in the Oxford program on negotiation, uh, Samarik Goulding, Mick Goulding, who was the former Under Secretary General of the UN for peacekeeping. And he, when he'd been at the UN, had tried again and again to try to make some progress on uh, Kashmir and was basically told, I'm sorry, the UN does not have a mandate there. So, so there's that sort of problem there. Um, in the case of Israel, these are, these are long and deep, so um, Israel, Palestine, these are uh, you know, long, long standing and deep seated. Um, periods of distrust. There have been occasions when there have been we've made real breakthroughs. Um, normally, these have involved outside parties, um, and um, the, 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 they they have and, and and they've also had the the juxtaposition of two leaders uh, who were willing to. Um, uh, to look at things afresh, we're willing to get away from some of the mistrust. But there's an immense well of, of mistrust there. And this is again where I think that the rhetoric doesn't help very much. And I think that, you know, we'll, we'll, it remains to be seen what um, uh, President Trump's recognition or the United States' recognition of Jerusalem um, as the capital of Israel um, how that will turn out, at least on the face of it at first, it looked like a pretty unhelpful declaration to make. Um, so I think these, sometimes they get perceived as trying to sort of gain ground before you actually get to the negotiating table, but it, they may just sort of put it further and further off. Um, I mean, there have been some really great breakthroughs um, in very intractable cases. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, in uh, 1975, um, after several wars in the Middle East, when Israel and Egypt um, were able to reach an agreement on the Sinai and actually sign a, 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 a peace agreement known as the Camp David Accords, 
that the breakthrough for that was when Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, said, I am willing to travel to Israel to meet the Israelis and start talking to them as neighbors rather than as enemies. But sometimes it does take something quite bold like that. Sadly, he lost his life as a result of it. Um, and there have been a lot of assassinations in these parts of the world where people have tried to boldly step out. So it's very tempting to say, can we, can we break out of the mold? But there are many, many, many players and many interests involved. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in all of these very intractable cases, it is, it is difficult to know how to make that breakthrough. Now, I've got another question here. I'm new to my role and have to sort out a messy negotiation. What would you say I should do just to sort out a messy negotiation? Well, the first thing I would suggest you do, which you may be doing, but uh, often people don't, is make sure you have an immense amount of information at your fingertips. So whatever the situation is, make sure you know very clearly what you want out of it, so you can lay out what your goals are to, to, to get out of this, this messy negotiation, this messy situation, but also understand what other, maybe you're dealing with one other person or one other entity, or maybe you're a whole lot, lot of different ones. Make sure you understand everything that is important to them. So you really need to do your research. It's the most important thing in negotiation is information gathering before you even get started. Then you can see, can I reframe whatever the challenge is differently? And then put yourself in the other side's shoes. So understand everything from their point of view, and then you can start looking at um, how you may be able to uh, address it. And of course, the other thing you do is sign up for the Oxford Program of Negotiation, and we'll teach you how to do that in much more detail. How can I address a power imbalance? One side feel they have more power, but we still need to negotiate. This is a very, a very common issue, actually, and um, uh, I think one thing that's important to remember is that if there is a negotiation taking place, both sides have concluded that there is something in it for them to negotiate. There's a reason they're at the table because they need to get something out of it. So you need to really analyze in a lot of detail just exactly what I'm assuming um, that you're on the side that feels they don't have so much power. So you need to try to analyze just exactly what it is that you have that they need. And you can actually, uh, in a way, expand that so you can actually trade. Negotiation is all about trading. It's about um, reciprocity. And um, so if you know you're able to learn what they need from you, you can then... Um, put together packages that respond to that need um, while not giving too much away yourself, but getting substantial things in return. So what you're trying to do, in fact, is even though they may have more power, um, you're trying to say, well, with a little bit of power we have, we can actually not exactly hold you to host hostage, but we can, um, uh, you know, you really need this from us. Let's see what you can give us as well. That's a bit oversimplistic, but again, if you come on our program, you, you'll get more of a sense of that. So um, I'm sorry, I went on rather long at the beginning of this webinar, so I hope that it was useful and interesting, and now we've run out of time. Um, if I could hand over to Zindi just to highlight, Zindi to highlight the dates and the cost of this program, which is an incredible bargain, I can tell you. Uh, very much hope people will sign up. Um, sort of questions you've been asking, they'll be answered in that program. Um, and I hope that what I've covered with this afternoon has been interesting. Over to you, Zinzi. Thank you very much, Tim. And, and just to say thanks again um, to you for a really interesting um, webinar today. It's been great to hear some of the examples that you've gone through in detail and just to get some of those insights from you in your practice. And also a thank you to our audience. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar, um, be it morning, afternoon or night for you. It's been great to have the questions come through, so thank you very much for sending those. Any that we haven't um, come up to answer this afternoon, and um, we will certainly look at those and reach out to the individuals, so you will get a response. Um, it will come from me, so you can see my email address there, um, it's zindzi 
www.cresswell at sbs.ox.ac.uk. Um, you can also use that email address to email me with any questions you might have about the Oxford Programme on Negotiation. It is a five-day residential programme that takes place here in Oxford. And we are looking for experienced professional negotiators to come and take part as part of a diverse group that Tim um, spoke of earlier. This year, the programme will take place the 17th to the 22nd of June, and then again on the 23rd to 28th of September. We are receiving applications for both sessions now, so it will be terrific to hear from you if you were interested in joining us, as I say. I will just um, hand you back over to Tim for a moment, but as I say, thank you very much, and please do feel free to get in touch. Just to clarify something that Zinzi said there, we are looking for professional negotiators. I think what we'd say slightly differently is, we're looking from people who negotiate in their very many varied professions, but not necessarily people who are full-time professional negotiators, because I think that we could probably learn quite a lot from the full-time professional negotiators as well as teach, but, but, but we're really looking for people who have to negotiate in their work, but also we teach what you have to do in your private lives as well. Um, so uh, you don't have to be somebody who writes down negotiator when you fill out an immigration form. Um, you can fill out businessman or diplomat or government official or whatever, and we'll try to help you negotiate better. Thank you. And um, thank you once more. We'll see you for our next webinar sometime soon. Bye now.